right children now we are going to discuss about diversity of leaves differences of leaves right so when you look at the environment when you look at different different plants you will see there are so many differences among plant leaves their shapes are different their colors are different right children so look at these plants given here we have number of plant leaves here right manioc curry leaves jack grass croton bryophylla known as akapana right pumpkin hatavaria katurumurunga osses benia there are these are some leaves that we can see in the environment look there are so many differences among these types of leaves look at this manioc leaf children look how the leaf blade is divided into parts but if you observe carefully even though this leaf blade is divided into five parts it is not completely divided right if you observe carefully from the base part right they combine again right so you will see this difference now here from this part these leaves are these tiny leaflets are combined uh, from the leaf base okay so it means it is not completely divided so if you did not look at this leaf carefully will you see this change children you will not okay so that is why you have to look at the environment carefully with special attention right children look at the curry leaves now curry leaves when you take the leaves now these type of leaves are known as compound leaves even last year we learned about these things right so this single unit is known as a leaf one leaf so you all can see its leaf blade is completely divided you all have seen curry leaves okay so these tiny parts are known as leaflets here also the leaf blade is divided but not completely here the leaf blade is completely divided and each part is known as a leaflet right so what is this jack leaf jack leaf is a it has a certain shape and if you observe you will see how the midrib and the veins present okay grass what is the shape of the grass it is a very thin and long leaf okay children what about this croton now look at this croton leaf all the other leaves present here are green color now this is a mix of green and yellow now you all have seen that croton there are different other colors as well purple maroon color right so here you can see the colors are different than the other leaves okay children what is this bryophylla can you see the leaf margin now can you see the leaf margin of jack leaf okay it is a smooth margin but can you see the bryophyllum margin it's a kind of wavy margin okay and if you touch this bryophyllum leaf you will see uh, it is a little fleshy because it stores water right children pumpkin leaf now pumpkin leaf also a kind of wavy margin present and if you touch this pumpkin leaf you will feel that hair like structures present on the surface of the pumpkin leaf right hatavaria hatavaria plant also has long slender leaves right katurumurunga now katurumurunga also has the same type of leaf as curry leaves but here curry leaf is a little pointed the leaflets are little pointed but uh, if you take katurumurunga if you observe this carefully this will the tip is blunt like this it's not pointed pointy tips are not there the tip is blunt round okay children so in this way if you look at different different plant leaves you will find there are so many differences among plant leaves now you can look at your environment and you can add some pictures or maybe uh, you can draw diagrams in your field book and you can even write down the names of these type of plant leaves okay children so we will see what we have next okay what is the main function of plant leaves 
when you look at the color, you all know what the function of plant leaf is. The main function of plant leaf is photosynthesis. Why? Because it has chlorophylls. That is why they are green in color, because of the presence of chlorophylls. Okay, so photosynthesis is the main function of plant leaves. So in order to do photosynthesis, what are the other essential factors, children? There are four main factors affecting photosynthesis. What are they? Yes, sunlight, water, carbon dioxide and chlorophylls. Right, it means apart from the presence of chlorophylls and carbon dioxide and uh, water, the plant leaves should get enough sunlight. Right, children? So here, photosynthesis mainly occurs in a, now we know the structure, in a plant leaf. Leaf. Right? Plant leaves get energy from sun to do photosynthesis. Right? Therefore, leaves are arranged on the stem in a way to get maximum amount of sunlight. Maximum amount of sunlight. So, if you observe carefully, again you will see, we will take a branch. If this is a branch, there is a certain way that plant leaves are arranged. Right? There are different patterns that plant leaves are arranged uh, in this branch. Right? One method is sometimes if in one level if plant leaves present to this side, in the next level plant leaves present to the other side. In this board, I can't uh, show it clearly. It's like this. Right. So, in the branch, if uh, in one level if plant leaves present like this, in the next level they present like this. Again, the next level they present like this. Why? What is the reason? So, then all the plant leaves they get enough maximum amounts of sunlight. Or maybe there's another way. Uh, sometimes plant leaves arrange as a spiral, the spiral method. Right. So, the reason behind this is plant leaves must get the maximum amount of sunlight in order to do photosynthesis. Understand children? Right. Now, we are going to see what are the parts of a plant leaf. Parts of a leaf. You must have done these type of activities when you are in your lower grade. So, I am sure now this is very clear. You all know how to do this now. Okay. So, shall we label this diagram, children? We have a, a picture of plant leaf, diagram of plant leaf. We have to label each part. Now, we will do that. You all can start with me. So, we'll start from here. What is this? This is the stalk of the plant, right? It's known as a petiole, right? Petiole or leaf stalk. What is this? This is the place where the leaf connects to the petiole. This is known as the leaf base. Leaf base. Right? What is this part? This petiole continues in the leaf to the tip. That is the main part. The middle part is known as the midrib. This is the midrib. And from the mid ribs, now in this leaf, you all can see the veins arise from the mid rib, right? So these are veins. So what are these tiny other branches? These are known as veinlets. Okay, now this one, leaf margin. Leaf margin. Sometimes there are wavy margins, serrated margins. Serrated margins means margins like this. Right? These are known as serrated margins. Wavy margins present. Right? Or smooth margins present like this. Okay? And what is this? 
the entire part. The surface is known as the leaf blade. Leaf blade. And this is the leaf tip. Leaf tip. Okay. So did you all mark this with me children? I hope so. So what are the parts of a leaf? Petiole or the leaf stalk and the leaf base and the midrib and the veins, veinlets, leaf margin, leaf blade and the leaf tip. Understand children? Take a good look at these uh, leaf veins children, veins and veinlets. How do they present? Based on the presence or the arrangement of these veins and veinlets, there are two different types of leaves. We are going to learn this now. Leaf venation. Now I already mentioned what are the leaf veins. So from these leaf veins, uh, water and other nutrients are taken to the entire part of the leaves through these veins, just like our blood vessels. Okay, children. So, based on the arrangement of these veins, there are two different types of leaves. We are going to learn that now, right? So, the arrangement of veinlets in the leaf is called leaf venation. Okay, children. So, based on the arrangement of veinlets in the leaf, there are two types of leaf venation. Number one, look at this one. This is the same as this picture, right? So here what happens, the veins present starting from the midrib, this is the midrib, all the veins are branched like this, it present as a net, right? This type of leaf venation is known as reticulate venation. If the veins present like this, that type of leaves known as the leaves with reticulate venation, right? Reticulate. Reticulate venation. Okay, so the veins present as a net. Okay, veins present as a net. And what are the examples? These type of leaves? Guava, mango, papo, jack. These are the examples. Guava, mango. So if leaf veins present as a net, that type of leaves are known as the leaves with reticulate venation. What is the other type? If you take a grass or maybe a coconut leaf. You will see midrib also like this, but all the veins are parallel to each other. They don't have branches like this. So if the veins present as this, that type of leaf venation is known as parallel venation. Right? Parallel venation. Parallel venation. Okay, so if this is the petiole, if this is the leaf stalk, all the veins start from the petiole and runs up to the leaf tip. Understand, children? So, what are the examples for these uh, leaves with parallel venation? That is, as I mentioned you, coconut, paddy, grass. So these type of plants have leaves with parallel venation. So it's very clear based on the arrangement of vein, let's see in the leaf, there are two types of leaf venation, that is reticulate venation and parallel venation. Right? So reticulate venation, the veins present as a net, examples, jack, guava, mango, pepo, examples. Right? And the other type is leaf veinlets are parallel to each other. 
they start from the leaf base and runs up to the leaf tip. Okay, children. So these type of veins are known as leaves with parallel venation. Examples, coconut, paddy, grass. Right, children? So I hope it's very clear now. We have to do an assignment now. So apply paint on the lower surfaces of some leaves and get copies of them to a white paper. Now you have to take different plant leaves. Uh, it's very important to find the names of those plants. Okay, children? So you have to find many plant leaves and you have to apply uh, paint. Maybe watercolors or any other paint, even food colors, okay. Right? So you have to apply paint on the lower surface because we are going to do this activity in order to find out the leaf venation. Right? So you can see the leaf venation very clearly from the lower surface. Okay, children? So that is why apply paint on the lower surfaces of some leaves and get copies of them to a white paper. Take a white paper and you have to apply paint. Like this, you have to get the print. So, and when you get the prints, you will see some of them have reticulate venation. Like this. And some other leaves, they have parallel venation. Okay, remember? We learned there are two different types of leaf venation, parallel and reticulate venation. Okay, so identify the type of leaf venation and classify them as reticulate venation or parallel venation. And finally paste them in your field book. You have to find leaves, you have to apply paint on the lower surface, get a print uh, to a white color paper and you have to paste it in your field book. And don't forget to label these leaves. Okay, you have to write the name of the plant under each leaf. Okay, children. So you can improve your knowledge by doing these type of activities. Understand? Right. Now we are going to learn another difference between plant leaves. Now we learn that there are two different types of leaves based on leaf venation, reticulate venation and parallel venation. Now we are going to see another difference. So based on the nature of the leaf blade, there are two other different types of leaves. We are going to find out this. Okay, simple and compound leaves. Now even in grade 6, you have learned about the simple and compound leaves. Even under this lesson, we are going to learn again. So what is the meaning of simple leaves, children? Look at these leaves. There are four different types of leaves. Shoe flower, jack, pepo and manioc. What can you tell about the leaf blade? It's a full leaf blade. It's not divided. Right. What about this jack? It's also not divided. It's very complete. What can you tell about pepo leaf? You can see it's divided. See, these are the different parts. Leaf is divided. But from this area, you all can see clearly, even though from the outside it's divided, from the middle area, they're all connected. Understand? Even this one, manioc, they look, they are almost all divided. But if you observe this part, from here, all these five parts are connected. It means, even though these two leaf blades are divided, they are not divided completely. They are divided only partially. Right? So from somewhere, from one point, they combine with each other. Okay, children. So if there is one type of leaf present where the leaf blade is not completely divided, that type of leaves are known as simple leaves. Understand, children? So when the leaf blade of a leaf is not divided into segments, it is called a simple leaf. Right? We will write. Simple leaves. The leaf blade of some simple leaves are partially divided. Here, like pepo and manioc, they are divided but partially. Right? So the leaf blade of some simple leaves are 
partially divided. Partially divided into segments. Okay. So what is the other type? Now we all know that uh, based on the nature of leaf blades, there's one type of leaves called simple leaves. What is the other type? Yes, you all know now. That is known as compound leaves. What are these examples? Coconut, tamarind, katurumurunga. You all have seen the mimosa plant and uh, curry leaves, right? So if you take the leaf, they are made out of tiny leaflets like this. Okay, so the entire leaf blade is divided completely. Now this is one complete leaf. This entire structure is known as a leaf. So this leaf blade is completely divided into leaflets. These tiny structures are known as leaflets. Right, children? So these type of leaves are known as compound leaves. Okay? Leaf blades of some leaves are completely divided. It's really important. Do you remember? This one in simple leaves, we discussed that leaf blade of a leaf is not divided or partially divided, not completely, right? So in order to consider a certain leaf as a compound leaf, the leaf blade should divide completely, right? Leaf blades of some leaves are completely divided into small leaf-like parts called leaflets, right? These types of leaves with leaflets are called, what is the name given? Compound leaves. Compound leaves. Examples, there are so many examples. Coconut, tamarind, katurumurunga, what else? Uh, curry leaves, mimosa, these are the examples. Okay, children. So we learn about leaves. Now you all know that leaves can be divided into two main groups based on leaf venation, as reticulate venation and parallel venation. And again, leaves can be divided into other two groups based on the nature of the leaf blade. So those two groups are compound leaves and simple leaves. So if you look at the environment carefully, you will see all these differences, children. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some examples for these type of leaves in the lab. Right, children. So far we discussed about the diversity of plant stems and plant roots. Now we are going to discuss about plant leaves here, right? So I have a lot of leaves here. We will discuss about each type. Now, what is this, children? This is a manioc plant leaves, right? So you all can observe very clearly uh, the shape of the leaf. You all can see the leaf blade. It is divided, but uh, it's not completely divided, right? Even though it looked like it divided, but it's not completely divided. Right from here, it is again connected. Okay, and here we have what is this? Curry leaves. We all have seen this, right? Curry leaves. Now you all can see if I take this uh, plant leaf. This is this is one leaf. It is completely divided into tiny leaflets. Right. So even though this looks like it's uh, divided, it's not completely divided. Uh, but this is actually completely divided into leaflets, okay? So, now this is a type of croton leaf. You, can, you like can see now these uh, leaves are uh, very long leaves and it has uh, different colors, yellow and green both. And this is also a type of uh, croton. I'll take one leaf, you all can see. It's a different shape, long but uh, different shape. And you can see the leaf margin, okay? It's a kind of wavy margin. And also when we discuss about the colors also, it's a mix of uh, pink and green, okay? Right. So what is this, children? This is a purple leaf, right? 
So look at this one. It also looks like it's divided, but you all can see from the base of the leaf, it's connected, right? So when you look at it at once, it looks like all the, this uh, leaf is divided into parts, but actually it is not, right? Kind of a big one. What is this, children? This is a coconut leaf. Actually, the coconut leaf, the whole thing, it looks like a branch, but that branch-like structure is the whole leaf. So it's kind of big structure, therefore we have only a part of it. Now this is also uh, divided into leaflets. This one part is known as a leaflet. Okay, right. Now this one, look at this one. What is this? This is a jack leaf, right? So you all can see the shape is different, okay? Uh, look at the margin and the tip of the leaf and you can see its uh, veins, right? And what is this one? This is bryophyllum or acapana, right? Bryophyllum, so when I touch this, it is fleshy because it stores water, right? So when you look at the leaf margin, it is kind of wavy. And what is this? This is a shoe flower leaf. It is also, it has a serrated margin right? Tiny piece-like structures are there. This is a serrated margin. And what is this, children? This is Hathavarya plant. You can see it has, uh, now if I take one leaf, this is one leaf, right? So it has tiny, uh, narrow, long leaflets. This is single leaf, right? And what is this? We know this one. This is a mimosa plant. Now at the moment, uh, the leaves are showing a sleeping movement. Therefore, you can't see it very clearly, right? So you all know that mimosa plant also, uh, the leaves also made out of tiny leaflets. And what is this? This is a mana plant. Now this mana plant, it has very long and slender leaves. And actually these leaves are, it has very sharp edges. Right? So, so based on the uh, shape of the leaves, based on the color, you will know that uh, there are different types of leaves. There is a diversity of plant leaves. Now when we take uh, some leaves, uh, that leaf blade presents as a simple structure, single structure. Right? But uh, when I take this uh, curry leaf, what will happen? It's not a, this is a single leaf, but it doesn't present as a single structure. It is made out of tiny leaflets. So if a certain blade, certain leaf blade, it is present as a simple structure, those type of leaves are known as simple leaves, right? So these type of leaves where the leaf blade divides into tiny structures called leaflets, these type of leaves are known as compound leaves. So what are the simple and compound leaves from here, children? We will see. Now, if I take this shoe flower uh, leaf, this is a simple leaf. It is not divided. Therefore, I'm going to keep it here, right? So I already explained this uh, curry leaf. It is coming under compound leaves because it is divided, completely divided into tiny leaflets, right? So I'm going to keep it this side. Jack leaf and also bryophyllum, they are not divided. Leaf blade is not divided. Therefore, they are coming under simple leaves. And what about this manioc children? I explained that manioc leaves, it looks like it's divided, but it's it actually not, right? It's not actually divided from the base. From the base, you all can see it is connected. Right? Therefore, this is coming under a simple leaf. What about Hathavarya? Hathavarya, you already explained. This is a single leaf. It is divided into tiny leaflets. Therefore, this is coming under compound leaves. And Mimosa, we all have studied this earlier as well. Mimosa has compound leaves which contains tiny leaflets. Uh, what about coconut? I already explained that. That coconut, it looks like the, the, what looks like the branch is actually not a branch. It is a single leaf. So it is made out of leaflets, right? Therefore, it is coming under compound leaves. What about croton? Croton, this is a single leaf, 
right? It is not divided, therefore it goes to simple leaves. And even this croton also goes to simple leaves because it is also not divided. What about papaya? Papaya, it looks like it's divided, but it's actually not. It is actually connected from the base of the leaf. Therefore, even though it looks like it's a compound leaf, it's actually coming under simple leaves. So what about mana? Now, when it takes mana, this is a single leaf. Now, this is, you all can see, this is not divided. Therefore, this goes to this simple leaf side. So, now we know according to the uh, appearance, right, uh, what are the differences between plant leaves and when we consider about the leaf blade, whether it's divided or not, we can uh, uh, group it into two like simple and compound leaves. Now I'm going to take another important factor that's about uh, leaf venation. But before we go to leaf venation, we will discuss about the uh, structure of these leaves, right? Here I have a checked leaf where I can observe this really well, right, all the parts. So what are the parts, children? What is this? This is the stalk of the leaf or this is known as petiole. And this is the place where the leaf starts, the leaf blade starts, right? This is known as the leaf base. And this whole thing is known as the leaf blade and this is the leaf tip. And this part is the leaf margin. And you all can see this midrib very well. If I look at this side, you all can see the midrib very well. So what are these branches coming from the midrib? These are known as the veins of the leaf. And even from these veins, you can see tiny other branches uh, arise. These are known as the veinlets, right? So when you observe this, you can observe the, uh, observe all the parts of the leaf really well. And now we are going to learn according to the structure of these veins, right? There are two different types of uh, leaf venations. That is uh, parallel leaf venation and reticulate leaf venations, right? First of all, I'm, I'm consider this one. Look at this one. You all can see uh, leaf, the veins are branched starting from the midrib, they have branched here and there are other tiny branches when let's also present. They present as a network here. You all can see it's actually a network, right? This type of venation is known as reticulate venation, right? If the leaf veins present like this, like a network, it is known as a reticulate leaf venation, right? Now I'm going to take this uh, coconut leaf, one of these coconut leaves. I'm going to take one, uh, it's difficult to tear, right. Now children, observe this carefully. Can you all see a branched vein system like before, like this uh, jack leaf, right? There's no branch system, but you all can see very clearly, you can see the midrib, that yellow color one. So you, if you observe clearly, you will see the veins present, but they are parallel to each other. See, they are present parallel to each other, not like branch system like this, right? So midrib present, leaf veins present, they are parallel to each other. So this type of leaf venation is known as a parallel leaf venation. So if you look at different plant leaves, children, you will realize some of them are branched, leaf veins are branched and some of them are not branched, they are parallel to each other. So we'll go through this one as well. Uh, if you observe this uh, curry leaf, I hope you all can see this, it's a kind of reticulate venation. So all these things are not very clear. I will show you uh, which you can observe very clearly. I hope you can observe this. They have branches. Therefore, they have a reticulate venation. I'm going to take, as we can observe it clearly, I'm going to take this papo leaf, right? Look at this one. It also has a reticulate venation or branched venation. Leaf veins are branched. You can see the other tiny branches also, right? This leaf also has a reticulate venation, right? What about this croton leaf, children? You all can see 
nicely it is branched right so this also has a reticulate venation what about uh, mana i'm being very careful when i touch mana because it's very sharp it has sharp edges right if you observe this mana you will see very clearly it has a midrib and it has parallel veins veins are parallel to each other therefore this mana plant has mana leaves have a parallel vein system or parallel venation so what did we learn children we learn different types of leaves different colors are there different shapes are there and we learn the parts of a leaf and also we learn there are two different types of leaves based on compound and simple leaves and also we learn about based on the venation there are two different types of vein systems present that is reticulate venation and parallel venation i hope it's clear right children so now it's very clear after observing some real plants uh, what is the reticulate venation what is the parallel venation and what are compound leaves and what are the simple leaves right so now we will discuss about the functions of plant leaves okay what are the functions of plant leaves if i ask one question what is the main function you all know the main function of plant leaves is what is that children yes photosynthesis the main purpose of plant leaves is photosynthesis that is because it has green color chlorophylls okay that is one important factor needed for photosynthesis okay so number 1 photosynthesis photosynthesis what are the other functions now this is the main function i will circle it this is the main function if you are to write down the main function of plant leaves you definitely have to write this if you write anything else it's not right okay so the main function of plant leaves is photosynthesis so what are the other functions children look at these two pictures we have aloe have you seen aloe leaves if you break these aloe leaves what will happen it is very fleshy right it stores water okay so jelly like substance present in these uh, aloe leaves okay that is because of storage of water so some plant leaves they store water right that is also another function and this akkapana another name is bryophylla or akkapana if you break a piece of this akkapana you will see it is also a little fleshy it means it also stores a little bit of water in it right children so there are some plant leaves they store water most of the time plant leaves present in these uh, uh, dry zones you all can see uh, those leaves they store water right so storage of water storage of water is the second function examples aloe akkapana or bryophyllum you will get familiar with both the terms bryophyllum the other function there's another function what can you see here this is a bryophyllum plant leaf akkapana leaf what can you see here this is one big leaf can you see tiny plants coming from the edges of this akkapana leaf what is this children that is because this akkapana leaf can produce new plants vegetative propagation or vegetative reproduction it means there are some plant leaves they can produce new plants okay some plant leaves produce new plants this is known as vegetative propagation vegetative 
propagation. Right? So what are the examples? I already mentioned here Akapana. Akapana or bryophyte. Right? Another example is a begonia, an ornamental plant. Right? Begonia. Right, children? So these are the functions of plant leaves. So the main function is photosynthesis, that is because of presence of green color, right? And some plant leaves, they store water, storage of water. Example, aloe, akapana, okay? And some other plant leaves are there, they can do vegetative propagation. They can produce new plants using plant leaves. For example, akapana or gryophyllum and begonia plants. Right, children? I hope this part is very clear now. And we have another assignment to do. Now I told you that akapana leaf can produce new plants. We are going to check that now. Right? So the assignment is place a leaf of bryophyllum in between two blotting papers. Now bryophyllum means akapana. You have to take a akapana leaf. You have to press it in between blotting papers or newspapers or maybe tissues. Place a leaf of bryophyllum in between two blotting papers and keep it between the pages of a book for few days. Press it. Right? Observe it after few days. What will you see? Identify the roots arising from leaf margin. They are called adventitious roots. If you take the akapana leaf like this, right? So when you take this and when you place this in between blotting papers and you have to press it using a uh, book or some weight. Okay, after about one week, when you observe, you will see very interesting thing. So from the notches, you will see tiny roots arise. Okay, children. So identify the roots arising from leaf margin. They are called adventitious roots, right? These are adventitious roots. Adventitious roots of akapana, right? Cut the leaf into pieces and get new plants by planting those pieces. Very interesting. If you take, if you take this part, this entire part then, you plant it separately, you will get a new plant. If you take this pattern, plant it separately in soil, you will get another plant. How interesting this process is, children. Right? So you all can observe this one and you can draw this diagram in your field book as well. But don't forget to do this experiment before you draw the diagram and uh, paste it in the field book. Right? Now I'm going to show you how to do this activity in the lab. Right children, now we are going to discuss about the vegetative propagation of plants. So I have a bryophyllum leaf here, a kapana leaf. Using this one, I'm going to show you what vegetative propagation is. So first of all, we have to press this plant leaf, this bryophyllum leaf, uh, for about uh, a few days, right? Um, this is a fleshy leaf and when you press it in between uh, blotting papers and you, when you have to keep it inside a heavy book or something and uh, after about uh, one week when you observe you will see something like this. Now this is a previously prepared one. So can you see from the margin new roots arise? New roots arise from the margin of the leaf. Okay, so if we leave it for another few days, you will see tiny buds come and we can plant this uh, uh, bud part. We can cut it off from that particular place and we can plant it and we can get new plants, right? So this is vegetative propagation. So basically, uh, 
reproduction of the plant is done by plant seeds but apart from plant seeds we can use some other parts of the plants as well. So one example is using plant leaves. So what are the other examples? We can use uh, stems of the plants as well. Now this is a manioc plant we can take the stem part right uh, and we can plant this and we can get new plants and sometimes certain plants we already learn these under roots right. Uh, plant roots also can be used as structures of uh, vegetative propagation. So it's very important to learn about these things. You also can try these things at home. Easily you can, if you use a plant leaf like bryophyllum, you can easily get new plants uh, using this plant leaf and that belongs to uh, vegetative propagation. Right children? So you all observe these adventitious roots of Akapana plant, right? So it was very interesting. You all can do the same experiment and you all can uh, press this type of leaf and you can add it to the field book. Okay, children? So now we are going to see the diversity of flowers. Now we are going to discuss about parts of a flower and diversity of flowers. Now when you look at flowering plants, the most important part of flowering plants is the presence of flowers. Okay, children? So under this lesson, we are specifically learning about the flowering plants. Now, what are the flowering plants again? The plants which bear flowers are known as flowering plants. So, under this part, we are going to learn the diversity of flowers. What is the importance of flowers, children? Now, when you are small, uh, if we ask the same question, uh, you would say uh, the flowers beautify the environment. That is right. Flowers are very beautiful. There are different colors of flowers. They have different shaped petals, right? They are very beautiful. Actually, what is the function of flowers? What is the real function of flowers, children? We will see. The main function of flowers is to produce fruits. How do they produce fruits? We are going to learn that part under this lesson. The seeds inside the fruits produce new plants. We all know that uh, by planting seeds, now fruits have seeds. Right? And by planting these seeds, we can obtain new plants. Right? We can obtain, we can get new plants by planting the seeds. Right? These are new plants, new generation. This is the fruit. So, what is this fruit, children? How do the fruits produce? Remember children, fruits are produced by flowers. The main function of flowers is to produce fruits. Isn't it very interesting? So plants produce flowers, flowers produce fruits. Fruits have seeds. By planting these seeds, we can get new plants. Okay children, therefore flower is very important for the reproduction of plants. So flower is considered as the main structure of reproduction. Okay, main reproductive structure of plants is the flower. Okay, children. So the main function of flowers is to produce fruits. The seeds inside the fruits produce new plants. Okay, the seeds are dispersed by various methods and uh, they become new plants. We are going to learn about this dispersal of seeds under the next part of the lesson. Okay? So flowers bear male and female reproductive structures. Now I told you flower is the structure of reproduction. The main reproductive structure of the plant is the flower. Right? So reproduction means production of new plants, the new generation. Okay? So flowers are very important to produce new plants. It means reproduction. So for this reproduction, flowers have male and female reproductive structures. Male and female. So some flowers have both male and female structures together. Or there are some flowers with only one type of structure, either male or female structure. Okay, children. So we will see this. We are going to first do this assignment about flowers. 
collect different types of flowers from the environment you can find so many different types of flowers different colors different shapes right and observe them carefully it's very important to find the name of these flowers as well okay children place them in between two blotting papers and keep it between the pages of a book for a few days so you have to press these flowers very nicely you have to press these flowers and after that paste them in the field book now you all have to prepare the field book under this lesson so after pressing these different types of flowers you have to paste these flowers in the field book and write the name of the flower okay children so remember i told you in order to learn about the plants it's very very important to observe the environment carefully with special attention okay so you have to collect different flowers you have to identify what are these flowers what is the plant that this flower belongs to right and you have to press them and you have to paste it in the book and you have to write the name okay children so we will see what are the parts of the flowers external appearance of shoe flower so we are going to study about the shoe flower now you all have seen shoe flowers it's very common in the environment right if you take a look at this shoe flower what are the things that you can see now here you all can start labeling this flower with me children what is this this is known as the stalk or pedicel right this is the pedicel or the stalk of the flower okay what is this green color part children you must have seen this green color parts present in the uh, flowers next to this stalk right if the flower is a bud if the flower is a bud most of the time you have seen this green color structures cover the entire bud right this green color structures are known as sepals these green color structures are called sepals right children so because they are green color they can do photosynthesis as well there are some flowers with colorful sepals as well okay what is this now this is the most prominent part of the flower these are the petals there are different sizes there are different colors as well these are the petals and what are these children these are the stamens now i'm going to teach you that stamens are coming under the male part of the flower right and what is this part this part is known as the stigma now stigma is a part of the female part of a flower right it's a it's coming under the female structure of the flower right children so you all can see these parts what about the other parts children is there something covered by these petals and sepals and the other parts now we are going to see that now this flower is known as the entire flower normally we can observe from outside but at the same time by looking at the flower externally you can't see all the structures you can't see the internal structures so in order to observe the internal structures you have to study a half flower right okay now this is the half flower of the shoe flower what is this half flower you have to cut the shoe flower into two equal halves and you have to observe very carefully okay children so what can you see now it's very clear earlier you could see only a few of these structures but now after cutting the flower into two halves you will see there are many other structures as well okay children we will identify these things now here this is the stalk or pedicel right 
What about this one? I told you that green color structures where that body is covered with. Those are known as sepals. And we mark this one as well. What are they? These are the petals. And I already explained you these are stamens. Stamen, right? And this is the stigma. Okay, children. What about this internal structure? If you observe clearly, you will see starting from stigma, string-like structure, a thread-like structure goes up to this middle part. That is known as style. Now, without cutting the flower into two equal halves, you can't see the style because style is covered by another tubular structure. That tubular structure, that outer tube-like structure is known as the staminal tube. Staminal tube. Okay, children. So, style is a thread-like structure. It's just like a thread. So, the end of this thread you will see this circular structure. This is known as the ovary. Okay, only if you observe the internal parts of the flower, only if you cut the flower into two equal halves, you can see the ovary. Okay, otherwise this ovary is covered with sepals and petals. Understand? So, this circular structure is ovary, okay? And inside the ovary, tiny egg-like structures present. These are known as ovules. These are known as ovules. Okay, children. So, it's very interesting when you study these things. You all have to find a shoe flower. If you can't find a shoe flower, that's totally okay. You can find another big flower like Tangbergia. Right? You all have to cut it into two equal halves and then you have to observe one half. So, you all can see these type of parts present in the half flower. Now, this is the half flower of shoe flower. Understand, children? So, you all can see pedicel or stalk. Sepals, petals, stamen. I told you stamen is the male part of flowers, right? Stigma, style, ovary, and ovules. Now, when we take this stigma, style, and ovary, that part is known as the female part of the flower. Do you remember I explained you in the beginning of this part? I explained you that flowers have male structures and female structures. Okay, so male structures, stamens can produce male cells. Female structures produce female cells. So when the male cells and female cells combine, a fruit is formed. Understand children? I hope it's very clear now. So a typical flower consists of the following parts. There are main parts, three main parts of a flower. What are they? We discussed about sepals. And number two, petals. Number three, male parts and female parts. Now we give a special name to the male part of the flower. That is androsia. Right? And we give another special name to the female part of the flower. That is gynosia. Okay. I told you some flowers have both male and female parts together. It means both androsium and gynosium together. And some other flowers are there. They have either male part or the female part. Therefore, the third part of the flower is 
Andrusian. Andrusian. I'm going to write and or both. And slash o. Why did I write that? Because I told you some flowers have both male and female parts together. Right? Some flowers only one part, right? Andrusian and or gynosian. Androsium is the male part, gynosium is the female part. Understand? Right? I will explain a little about this androsium and gynosium here. Right? Now, I told you this stamen is coming under the male part. Stamen is coming under the male part. Uh, therefore, another name for androsium is stamen. Okay? So, androsium means the stamen. Now, stamen has two other structures, children. Right? Stamen has two other structures. This is the anther. This is known as the filament. Stamen is made out of two parts, anther and filament. So, anther and filament together known as stamen. Understand? So, stamen is androsium. What about the gynosium? I told you when I was explaining this, the stigma, style, and ovary containing ovules coming under the female part. Female part is known as the gynosium. Right? So, stigma, style, the string like structure, and ovary. So, inside the ovary, ovules are there. Tiny egg like structures. Okay? This is the stigma. This is the style. This is the ovary. And ovules. So this is the gynosia. Another name for gynosium is pistil. Understand? So, what actually happens here? Now, I told you male part is there, female part is there, and flower can become a fruit. How does this happen, children? This is really interesting to learn this part, right? Remember, this male part, stamen, has anther. Anther has tiny grain like structures called pollen. You have heard of pollen before, right? Tiny parts called pollen. Right? This pollen contains male cells. Pollen contains male cells. And in this gynosium, these egg like ovules contain female cells. Okay, so how does this happen? I told you when they combine, when male cells and female cells unite with each other, it can produce a fruit. So what happens? This pollen touches the stigma. So through the stigma, it can go through the style and go up to this ovule cell combined with these female cells. And then what happens? This ovary becomes the fruit. When they combine, this ovary develops into fruits. What happens to the ovules? Ovules will become the seeds in the fruit. Okay, children. Isn't this very interesting, children? So, pollen touches the stigma. Through stigma and style, it goes up to the ovary and it meets these ovules and they combine. 
so male cells and female cells combine and then this ovary develops into the fruit and ovules become the seeds. So what is pollination? You have heard of pollination. Pollination means the process of this pollen touching the stigma. When pollen goes and contact with the stigma, that process is known as pollination. How does this pollination take place? By wind. Because of wind, these tiny pollen grains, this pollen can go and deposit on stigma. Maybe on the same flower or maybe on a different flower of the same species. Or when it rains, because of water also, pollen washes away and touches the stigma. There's one another very important activity which helps this pollination. What is that activity? That is by the insects. You all know that these uh, insects like bees, butterflies, they come to suck nectar from the flowers. So when they move around, now here pollen present in this uh, stamen, their tiny legs touches this pollen. So when they move around, their legs touch this pollen and when they come to somewhere here, their legs will touch the stigma. So through stigma, through the style, this pollen can go up to ovary and ovules. Right children? So I told you, pollen deposits on stigma, that process is known as pollination. Pollination. So pollination takes place because of wind, because of water and also because of insects. Understand? So pollination process is very important for the production of fruit. If pollination doesn't take place, it means if pollen doesn't touch the stigma, what will happen? These male cells and female cells will not meet each other and therefore fruits cannot be formed. Understand children, therefore this pollination process is very very important for the production of fruits and thereby for the productions of seeds. If seeds are produced, that particular plant can produce new plants, the next generation. Understand children? Now I hope it's very clear. We have to do an assignment now. Assignment. What we have to do here, select a shoe flower. If you can't find shoe flower, uh, you can use another flower like Thumbergia, somewhat big flower, right? Cut and separate the flower into two parts, longitudinally, vertically, right? By carefully cutting it from the pedicel using a sharp blade. I'm going to show you how to do this now, okay? And identify its parts. Now we already know what are the parts of a complete flower and a half flower, right? And draw a diagram of the half flower in the field book and label the parts. First, you can draw the diagram of a complete flower and then you can draw a diagram of the half flower. Not only that, you can even press this complete flower and half flower and paste it in the field book. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how to do this activity. Okay, children. So we discussed about different parts of the flowers, right? So I hope you remember there are four different parts of the flower. What are they, children? So the main part is, there are four main parts, uh, sepals, petals, androsium. Now androsium means the male part of the flower and gynesium. Gynesium is the female part of the flower. So if you observe this flower, we can observe some of them very clearly. Okay, you can see this is the stalk of the flower and this is the, these are the sepals and these colorful petals we have. And what is this part, children? Now, these yellow color parts, this belongs to the androsium, the male part. These are known as stamens, right? So, stamens have two structures, anther and filament. We all learn about that. And what about the gynesium? Gynesium has three main parts. What are they? This part is known as stigma, right? And this structure is known as Style and the other part is 
ovary. Now the thing is we can't observe the ovary here because the ovary is covered with the sepals and petals. So in order to observe the inner structure of the flower, we are going to separate this flower into two pieces so that we can observe the flower, the inner parts of the flower very clearly. So we will separate it. I am going to cut this one and I am going to cut this into two equal halves. Carefully you can separate it. You all can do this at home children. It's not that difficult to uh, find a shoe flower or any other flower you can use. Right children, now this is a half flower. We have we divided it into two equal halves. Now this is half of the flower or half flower. So we can observe this carefully to see what are the parts that we could not see before. Now here outermost layer is the sepals, the green color part. And then we have the petals. And you all can see here inside these petals this ovary is present. Right now this we couldn't see before because it was covered with the petals and sepals layer. This present inside. Now you can see it very clearly. This is the ovary, right? So in these ovaries, if you observe carefully, you can see these egg-like structures. These are known as ovules, right? And can you all see this tiny string-like structure? Now this is the style and this part is the stigma. Now this is actually is the gynaceum of the uh, plant, right? So these uh, stigma, style, ovaries and ovules all belong to gynaeum of the plant or in other words uh, it is the female part of the flower, right? So earlier this style was covered with the staminal tube. This is known as the staminal tube, right? So these yellow color parts, these are the stamens, right? Stamens, so they are known as androsium, the male part of the flower. Right children? So if you observe clearly you can see two other parts. This yellow color head like structure is known as the anther and this tiny hair like structure which connects it to the uh, staminal tube is known as the filament. So you all can do this activity and ho at home and you all can observe what are the parts of a flower. So it's very clear that when you observe a flower, you can identify different parts. So if you observe a half flower, you can identify many parts, more other parts as well. Right children. So it was very clear, right, how to uh, cut this flower into two equal halves. And it was very clear when you cut the flower into two equal halves, you can observe the internal parts very clearly. So I hope you understand there are main parts of the flower and there are different functions as well, right children? So you can paste these pictures of these flowers, pictures of the half flowers and you can even press the complete flower and half flower and you can add it to your field book, okay? Right. So now here we have the parts of the flower. I told you there are three main parts, sepals, petals, and what are the other parts? Androsium and gynosium. Okay, so when it comes to sepals, that is number one. Sepals, what is the importance of sepals? I already explained you. When the flower is a bud, when the flower is in its young stage, tender stage, these sepals can protect the flower bud. Right. So the main function of these sepals is protection of flower bud. What is the other function children? I told you most of the sepals are green in color. They are four. They can do photosynthesis. But remember there are some sepals. They are colorful. For example bougainvillea. Now bougainvillea flowers you see it's like beautiful colorful flower. But actually that colorful part is a sepal. Understand? So the sepals, what are the functions of sepals children? Number one, protection of 
flower buds flower buds number 2 what is number 2 photosynthesis photosynthesis right children now number 2 the second structure second part of flowers is petals what is the importance of petals children now remember now when we draw the half flower it's very clear this ovary is protected by the petals and even the sepals right ovary is protected by the petals Therefore, one function of these petals is protection of the internal structures of the flower. Right? Protection of internal structures of the flower is very important. Without harming the ovary and ovules, it should be protected. Right? That is done by the petals. What else, children? We will write the first one. Protection of, protection of the internal parts internal parts of the flower right and number two now the important function is these colorful petals can attract insects right so, what is the importance of attraction of insects, children? Now, when these petals are very colorful, insects attract to the flower. What is the importance of attraction of insects to the flower? I explained you, insects are very important for pollination. Now, we have the stamens. Stamens has pollen. So, when these tiny insects, they fly around here, their tiny legs touch these pollen and Pollen touches the stigma and then the pollen can reach the ovary. And thereby, it's very easy for the flower to produce a new fruit. Okay, so when these flowers have these attractive large petals, they can attract insects and insects are important for pollination. Right, so that is why the petals are the most prominent part of the flower. Right, so we will write. Attract insects for pollination. Now I explain you what pollination means. So sepals, protection of flower buds and photosynthesis. Right? And petals, protection of the internal parts of the flower and attract insects for pollination okay right and then the third structure androsium androsium is the male part i gave you another name for androsium what is that stamen right the male part of a flower the male part of a flower is called androsium which consists of stamen, right? Each stamen is made up of two parts. I already explained you. Now, this is a stamen. It has two parts. What are they? This part is known as anther. And this is the filament. So, anther and filament together is known as stamen. Okay. So each stamen is made up of two parts. What are they? Anther and filament. Anther and filament. So what is the function of stamen? So androsia, I told you, they produce pollen. And pollen is very important for the production of fruits because pollen has male cells. Okay, so we will write function, function is production of 
production of pollen. Understand, children? So the male part of a flower is called androsium, which consists of tamer. Right? Each stamen is made up of two parts, anther and filament. And the function of this stamen or androsium is production of pollen. Understand? Right. So here, there are different types of stamen present in different types of plants. Look at this now. Lotus has a stamen present surrounding this middle part. Right? Cannonball. Cannonball. It has stamen is only one side, right? And flame lily yoniangala, it has their stamens in a lower position. Right in lily, you can see here is the stigma, but stamens present below the stigma, right? So you will know that in this uh, shoe flower, stamen present like this. We studied that one, right? So you will see in some flowers, different types of flowers if stamens present even like this okay there are some flowers that stigma present like this and stamen present like this okay so you will have to observe the flowers very carefully i'm sure you will be able to identify these different different types of stamen okay children right so the next one, next part is gynosium, the female part. I gave you another name for gynosium. What is that? I hope you remember. It's known as pistil. Pistil. So this is the gynosium. Gynosium consists of different parts. Three main parts are there. What is this? Stigma. What is this? Style and ovary. And ovary has ovules. So the main parts are stigma, style and ovary. So what is the function of this pistil or gynosium or the female part? The function is production of seeds. How come? I told you when this ovary develops into a fruit, ovules become the seeds. Right? So function. Production of seeds. production of seeds. So I told you after pollination, pollination means pollen comes and touches the stigma and then the male cells in pollen, they will reach this ovaries and they will combine with the ovules or the female cells. Then afterwards, this ovary will develop into a fruit. This entire flower will develop into a fruit. Okay, so when it develops into a fruit, this ovary becomes the fruit and ovules become the seeds. Ovary becomes the fruit and ovules become the seeds. What will happen to these sepals and petals? They fall off, right? They fall off. Understand children? So I hope it's very clear when we discuss about flowers, there are different parts and there are different functions as well. Okay, children. We have a small activity to do. Complete the following table with the help of the features of flowers that you have observed. Now, so far we observed so many flowers. Now, I'm sure you must have learned what are the names of those flowers and what are the differences as well. Okay, so using that knowledge, we can do this activity. So, white colored flowers. One example is given. You have to write other examples. Now, here I don't have enough space to write many examples. But when you do this activity, you can write as many as examples. Okay. 
So white colored flowers, id. What are the other white colored flowers? Gardenia, jasmine. Okay, we'll write. Gardenia, jasmine, roses, white roses are there and colorful roses also there. Flowers in colorful petals. Rose, what else? Shoe flower. Right. What are the other flowers? Lotus. Right. Flowers that bloom at night. Now there are some flowers, they bloom at night. Okay, children, what are the examples? Say palika is one good example. Another good example is a kadupul flower, or queen of the night. Right? Queen of the night, or kadupul. Kadupul. So remember, children. So most of the flowers that bloom at night, uh, they have light colored petals like white or other light colored petals. What is the reason? So that insects can spot these flowers easily, right? Flowers with sweet smell or fragrance. Sweet smell, jasmine. What else? Gardenia. Lavender. Okay, rose. Right? Flowers with nectar, that sweet sap, sweet nectar. Right? Examples, katurumurunga and shoe flowers. Even lavender. Okay, so as I told you, you can find many examples under this activity, right? Observe your environment, find more examples, look at those flowers, find what are the special characteristics of those flowers as well. Okay, children, so I hope you understood about the flowers. We learn about what are the parts of the flowers, what are their special functions, right, children? So now we are going to learn about the fruits and seeds. Right? Diversity of fruits and seeds. Now we already know fruits are formed by flowers and fruits have seeds and when we plant seeds we can get new plants. Right? Fruits are formed from the flowers of flowering plants. So only flowering plants can produce fruits. Can non-flowering plants produce fruits? They cannot because they don't have flowers. Right? Now you already know that flowers develop into fruits, right? So fruits are from, from the flowers of flowering plants. Seeds are found inside the fruits. Seeds produce new plants, right? So flowers develop into fruits. I will draw it here. And fruits have seeds and seeds can produce new plants. Right? New plants. These are the seeds. And fruit and flower. Understand? So after producing these seeds by a fruit, it's very important for these seeds to disperse away from the plant. Right? So there are different methods of dispersal of fruits and seeds. Okay, children. What is the importance of dispersal of fruits and seeds, children? What is the need of dispersal of fruits and seeds? Let's say that there is a large mango tree. 
right a lot of fruits are there okay so why can't these fruits fall under the same tree and these seeds can produce new plants under the same plant the same mother plant new this first plant is known as the mother plant right so why can't these mango seeds can produce new plants under the mother plant children why do they need to disperse dispersal means go away from the mother plant why do they have to go to another place and plant just imagine if all these seeds plant under the same plant right there will be number of new mango plants and there will be a huge competition between these mango plants for the resources they need okay so for space for light for nutrients in the soil there will be a huge competition so can they survive they cannot survive because around this plant only a limited amount of resources present only limited amount of nutrients present in the soil right children therefore it's better to disperse go away from the mother plant and plant in a different place right so there are natural seed and fruit dispersal methods are there most of the time fruits and seeds are dispersed by four different ways four main ways that is by wind by water by animals and by explosive mechanisms explosive mechanisms okay these are the four main methods of dispersal of fruits and seeds so now you all know that flowers can produce fruits fruits can produce seeds when this when we plant these seeds we can get new plants right so it's very important for these seeds to disperse from the mother plant okay in order to obtain all the necessary factors for growth okay so there are four main methods of dispersal of fruits and seeds by wind by water by animals and by explosive mechanisms understand we have an assignment collect fruits and seeds that are fallen near trees in the school garden collect the seeds into a seed box and again collect fruits and seeds that are fallen under trees in your home garden as well so you can collect different types of fruits and seeds into a seed box and observe them their shape their color their size right collect different types of fruits and seeds that are not found regularly okay try to find the names of those plants as well it's very good if you can find the names as well right and put each of those seeds in a polythene packets and paste in the field book and name them you can make small polythene packets with see through polythene packets right so from the collection take one seed each and you can paste this in the field book and under this you can write the name right let's say castor seeds example okay children so you can find many seeds from the environment try to find the name of the plant as well right collect them into a box you can maintain a seed box as well that's also one important activity that you all can do right and take one seed you have to put it into a polythene packet and paste it in your field book right children and write the name as well okay children so i explained to you that it's very important for these fruits and seeds to go away from the mother plant why otherwise they can't find the necessary factors for the growth of the plants and i explained to you that there are four main methods of dispersal of fruits and seeds understand what is the first method that we discussed about fruits and seeds which are dispersed by wind look at these pictures children there are some seeds that disperse by wind look at this one cotton wara hora or dipterocarpus gum malu okay now remember children in order to disperse by wind 
there are some special adaptations so special characteristics of these seeds let's say that in order to whisk away by wind what is the main characteristic that they should have they have to be light okay light weight most of these seeds are light in weight right very light now when we take these cotton seeds you can see cotton wool here these seeds are found inside this cotton wool tuff right and vara seed they are also very light okay children so at the same time what are the other adaptations now being lightweight is one characteristic another characteristic is being small only if it is very small it can go away with the wind right what else children can you see if you take this vara now this seed has these hair like structures because of the hair like structures they can whisk away with wind right what is this hora or dipterocarpus they have a special seed like this it looks like a propeller now this is the seed these two wing like structures are there so because of the presence of these wing like structures again this seed can disperse with wind move away with wind okay what is this gum malu can you all see this middle part is the seed so around the seed a membrane like structure is there it is a very light membrane like structure so because of the presence of this membrane like structure the seed becomes light okay so it can move along with the wind understand children so these are the examples so these are the characteristics of seeds that disperse by wind we will write what are the special adaptations 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 means changes take place adaptations presence of hair like structures hair like structures right presence of wing like structures what else children light weight light weight and most of them are small understand right presence of hair like structures presence of wind like structures and light in weight and small okay there's another characteristic as well most of these seeds are produced in large numbers okay they produce most of these plants that produce seeds that disperse by wind they produce seeds in large numbers that is another characteristic but these are the main characteristic or main adaptations of seeds that disperse by wind understand children right now we are going to discuss about the fruits and seeds which are dispersed by water now i told you basically fruits and seeds are dispersed by wind water uh, animals and explosive mechanisms now we are going to discuss about the fruits and seeds which are dispersed by water right look at these fruits and seeds children we can see arecanut coconut cucumba dia kadru and lotus look at this coconut now coconut is kind of a big fruit it's a nut okay so can you even imagine that coconut like big fruit uh, dispersed by water now we think it's a type of heavy fruit but i will show you how that happens okay so when we consider about this coconut arecanut and even cucumba right they have a special cover around the fruit fibrous cover so if this is the fruit the cover is made up of fiber right even cucumber cucumber is also like that they have a fibrous cover okay so what happens children 
in between this fiber air is trapped so what happens because of the trapped air the weight of this fruit is less it can nicely float on water right children that is because of the presence of air in between this fiber you all have seen this coconut fiber okay the cover when you remove the husk of the coconut that husk is made up of coconut fiber so in between this fiber there are spaces these spaces are filled with air right children so that is why even though coconut is big it can still float on water because of the presence of air in this fibrous cover okay so this is a type of adaptation of these fruits and seeds dispersed by water now i told you adaptations the special features right children and the kadru also has a fibrous cover like this and there are some other fruits have that uh, uh, seed covers with air spaces like lotus right now lotus seed cover has air sacs air spaces in it okay so because of the presence of air spaces the spaces or sacs filled with air again the entire structure's weight is less and it can easily float in water understand so these are the adaptations of uh, fruits and seeds that are dispersed by water so shall we write down this one we can write some of them are lightweight as well okay presence of presence of fibrous cover fibrous cover right presence of air field seed covers right children presence of fibrous covers presence of air filled seed covers these are the adaptations of uh, seeds and fruits that are dispersed by water we will see the other method fruits and seeds which are dispersed by animals look at these seeds and fruits children there are a lot here tomato pepper chilies love grass olinda right castor nagadarana apple mother tea or red beans okay look at these fruits and seeds they are very colorful and when you look at this tomato and pepper uh, they have a fleshy part okay children uh, mango pepper tomato guava they have a fleshy part so that animals can feed on them so after eating let's say a monkey is eating a mango so after eating the fruit it will drop the seed somewhere else so that uh, it, it helps to uh, disperse the seed away from the mother plant okay and what about this love grass look at love grass even nagadarana by look at this nagadarana can you see a hook like structure a claw like structure so what happens children when even in love grass the same type of structures are there okay so when animals go closer to them these love grass and even nagadarana they can cling to animal fur right because of the presence of these claw like structures they can cling to uh, animal fur and when the animal goes somewhere else it will go along with the animal land drop somewhere else okay and look at this mother tear olinda they are very colorful because of color so some animals attract right but at the same time can you see this olinda it's a certain pattern there is a certain pattern just look like a ladybird right so there are sometimes there are some seeds with special patterns to mislead animals even castor looks like tiny beetles right so what happens birds and some other animals they think that uh, they are tiny bugs they are tiny insects and they go and take them and move somewhere else when they are going to eat it they understand that it's actually not a bug then they drop in somewhere else understand so that's how 
the seeds and fruits dispersed by animals. There are so many methods and there are so many adaptations as well. Understand? So, we will write some of these adaptations now. Presence of a presence of a of a fleshy part. Fleshy part or edible part. Okay, and presence of claw like structures like hooks, like in Nagadarana, love grass. And number three, colorful. Seeds and fruits. What else? I told you there are special patterns to mislead animals. Okay? Patterns to mislead animals. Okay, children. So, these are the adaptations of seeds and fruits that are dispersed by animals. Now, do you remember the last method of dispersal of uh, fruits and seeds? I hope you remember. What is that? Using explosive mechanisms, right? Fruits and seeds which are dispersed by explosive mechanisms. Now, this part is not explained in the textbook, but anyway, you are going to learn this later. Right? This is also equally important. Look at these pictures, children. We have balsam, rubber, olinda. Now, have you seen children? Now, this balsam is a very common plant. Have you seen they have a special pod-like structures here? They have a pod like this. Right? The pod looks like this, a little bit transparent. So, if you press this pod, you must have seen, some of you must have seen this. If you press this pod, what will happen? It will explode and all the seeds will scatter. Right? It will explode and seeds will scatter. Okay, children. So, these pod-like structures, if we press it, that's what happens. The seeds will scatter. This process takes place naturally as well. Even if we don't press these type of pods, when these pods, they grow mature, then what happens? At one point, they will explode. Right? So, by explosive mechanisms, because of the pressure created during this explosion, these seeds, they scatter, they spread. Understand, children? So, what happens? Balsam, even rubber. Look, this is the special fruit. Right? Even all in the... When these pods, they get matured, what happens? At one point, they explode. So, when they explode, because of the pressure created, these seeds, they scatter. Okay, children. So, I hope it's clear how these seeds are dispersed by explosive mechanisms. So, when you look at some seeds and fruits, children, uh, there are more than one method of dispersal of these fruits and seeds. Now, look at this example all in the... Now, all in the seeds are dispersed by explosive mechanisms. At the same time, they are dispersed by animals as well. Yeah, I told you. They look like ladybugs. Therefore, uh, that is a special pattern to mislead animals. Okay, children. So, there are some fruits and seeds. They disperse using uh, more than uh, one mechanism, method. Okay, children. So, that is also you have to understand. I hope this part is very clear now. 